Hello, hello, happy May. Today is May 1st, welcome. I'm Dr. Susan Blum. Um, welcome back to all of my peeps who've been following me every week. Gosh, I think this is my fifth or sixth. Uh, what I can say is that today is May 1st, and today is May 1st, and I am officially, because on my first day at home, uh, my last day in the office was a Thursday. So today is officially seven full weeks that I have been quarantined, you know, pretty much at home. I've gone out to go to the store and I've been going out now and I've been going out walking. Um, and I've gone to the, I've gone to the drugstore once I've been to the grocery store a few times and, um, and I'm, and I'm walking definitely very regularly last weekend for the first time, I actually went to Rockefeller state park. I went to one of the parks and did a trail walk with one of my friends, one of my girlfriends who I haven't seen since the beginning, but we are, I know she's been quarantined at home with her husband. And so I know that she's safe, but we both, you know, stay, we didn't like cozy up next to each other. We didn't greet each other physically. We just sort of walked a couple of feet apart from each other. And, um, and we did our two hour trail walk. It was awesome. I, I think not only was the exercise good, which of course exercise is so great, but uh, I felt like a little normal again. You know, I felt that little sense of, okay, you know, cause she and I used to meet at Rockefeller at, once a month. That was like, that was our thing. And so we always did that for years. We've been meeting once a month. I mean, we'd skip months here and there in the dead of the winter, but um, for the most part, we've met pretty much consistently every month. And so it felt really good to meet her there uh, this past weekend. It was crowded. Um, it started getting more crowded as the day went on. I know the trails because I'm so familiar with it. We, we moved right off into more the back country of it's a big preserve. So you do have to be careful if you go on a trail walk. Um, everyone is so good here in New York. We're all, everyone's being mindful, people wearing masks. I had my mask. I took my mask off actually um, when there was nobody around. If she and I were not near anyone, I took my mask off. I really wasn't worried, you know, cause I know that she's okay. You know, like, so if you have people you've been, that you know, you've been quarantining, they've been quarantining, you know, that's actually one of the first next steps as we come out of our stricter quarantine is to have, is to expand our circle to a group of people to see regularly who you know are also being really, really mindful right of um who they're exposed to so so we were good with each other um and we um and we uh when i passed anybody in the trail i we all went like far to the wide like we gave each other wide berth and i put my mask on if i saw someone coming so anyway that felt a little feelings of normalcy which felt really really good uh so i encourage you to get outside if you live in the city or you live in an area that there's not much outside, get in your car and go drive, find, find some remote park. Well, you don't want to end up in where it's too crowded, but if you know where you can go, where it's not crowded, you know, I knew that I could go to the not crowded area there. I knew that it's so big people would spread out, which they did. And so um, I think it'll be really hard for all of us if we can't this summer, like get out and go for a walk and go to the woods or go to the beach. And I know that that's a big thing right now in terms of potentially closing the beaches. And that's going to be really rough for all of us. Um, we have to do what we have to do. And I think if people minded the rules and we could keep the beaches open, but we all have to stay spaced apart um, and have our social distancing even when we're out. And so if we can learn how to do that, we can go out. Uh, so that's that's sort of my little thing about that. I'm going to trust you're going to ask me questions, all the public health kind of questions about where we are in the in the process. Um, I'll make a few comments, just very brief comments, like I always do. So again, this is May first, so I have to put the timestamp on this because next week it'll be different, and this might be different than what I talked about last week. Although I do try to talk, you know, explain the changes that I'm letting you know about. Um, I think what's new for this week is that there was good news about um, a vaccine. Um, there's, there's this interesting technology that a group in Oxford uses. It's not the normal way to develop a vaccine. It's a, a little bit different, which expedites it because they're sort of already, if you think of a football field, they're already like way down the field um, 
sort of ready to use it for any virus, you know? So their technology is like a general kind of technology that gets them pretty far and then they can just specialize it for this virus. Um, I think the big problem, don't think that all of a sudden this vaccine is going to come to you in September, because even if it's, if it's um, approved, you know, because they're doing human trials right now, even if it looks good, which we won't really know till September, there's various hurdles it has to go through. So first, you have to make sure it's safe and it doesn't make people worse. Then you have to make sure that, that it causes them to make antibodies. And then you have to make sure that it, it makes the kind of antibodies that are that prevent someone from getting sick again. And so it has some hurdles to go through, but it's looking pretty good in the monkeys. Um, but the problem is that you know, there are a lot of people in the world and there are a lot of people that are going to need this vaccine. And the question is, how fast can we make it? And the federal, so the federal government, this is what Fauci was saying this week, is the federal government has decided that, which, and this is a good thing, and actually, they, they talked about this at the very, very beginning of the pandemic, that one of the ways to fast track a vaccine is to spend a, uh, for the federal government to pay the bill uh, to start making tons of this vaccine. Like they're going to start producing it now, even though they don't know it's good. They might end up throwing it away and it won't be useful. But they and, the, and so the drug companies can't take that chance. So I think it's Gilead who, or whoever makes, oh, no, that's Remdesivir, who are the Oxford folks who make this vaccine they're not gonna spend the money to produce the vaccine right now because they wanna make sure it's good first. But what our government is saying, we'll, we'll foot the bill and we'll pay for you to make it now, even if we lose all that money, because then in September, we'll have a lot more doses than, um, you know, we'll have a lot of vaccine and we'll have enough for people. So the big controversy and the big discussion now is, okay, let's say there is that vaccine, who gets it first? Who gets it first? Which populations? I mean, we can all imagine the healthcare workers are going to all get it first, for sure. And then after that, who gets it? You know, and then you go into all the problems in our society and then around the world of, you know, who's on the top of the totem pole and who's in the bottom. And uh, so it's going to be a really um, interesting, crazy time to see how fast the vaccine can be distributed to the population at large. And so I don't it's hard for me to conceive that there'll be, it'll be, there will be a vaccine and there'll be enough of the vaccine to, to immunize enough people to prevent the, the virus from being present in our, in our communities this winter. So I don't know that it's going to, um, it's not going to prevent, it's not going to, we won't get herd immunity for this winter. It just, I don't think it could happen that fast, but it will really reduce the number of people that get sick. And certainly the high risk people can get vaccinated, like the older folks and like everyone, you know, what should happen? The healthcare workers and everyone over 70, you know, and you can start there. So, um, but we'll see, that'll be a big debate. You wait and see. So as Rachel Maddow would say, watch this space. There'll be a big debate about who gets the vaccine first. That's what's gonna happen next. So um, on the front, so that's the big, uh, big treat, that, that's in public health world, that's the big thing. The other big thing is um, what's, what's new in treatment. The antiviral remdesivir hit the news this week. There are a couple of really good studies uh, showing that remdesivir appears to shorten the duration of illness. Um, but don't get too excited about remdesivir yet. It's not going to cure this virus, okay? Because the issue with remdesivir, it's an intravenous uh, medication. It does not, um, you can't take it with a pill. So you, you're you not going to, um, uh, it, you can't give it to people until they're in the hospital. Uh, unless somehow they can set up outpatient places. I don't know, maybe somebody, they'll get creative and they'll figure out a way to give it to people in an outpatient setting, but then if to mass produce remdesivir, you have to have syringes and to try to give intravenous um, doses to so many people um, is pr like, that's logistically gonna be a nightmare too. So, so, so the next step in remdesivir is gonna be who gets it and how to give it to people. And my guess is that, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Tamiflu. Well, Tamiflu is an antiviral and it's for the flu, it's for influenza. You, in order for Tamiflu to work and to be effective, you take it the minute you see you're sick. So you, you get a fever or you have a body ache, you run to the store, you call your doctor and you ask them to call in a prescription for Tamiflu and you take it the day you get sick. 
Tamiflu doesn't work if it's five days in or six days in or seven days in because it controls, it helps suppress the replication of the virus early on. And so mm, I would say my suspicion is, and from what I read, there's a big suspicion about this, that remdesivir is going to work best like a Tamiflu early in the illness. But the problem is it's not oral. So right now they're giving it to people in the hospitals who are the sickest people. And the good news is it's showing an effect of shortening the duration of the illness. I bet, I mean, I'm hopeful, maybe it would even have a more powerful effect if you gave it to somebody the day that they, they get diagnosed. You know, they, they think they're sick, they get a test the same day, they're, di they're positive, they start the remdesivir. I think that that's going to be the way that remdesivir will have a big impact. So, so watch that space. That's my prediction on that. Um, and the meanwhile, it's a nice thing. To, it's good that we're going to use it in the hospitals if it continues to work. So the studies are they're just, they're the, the early results of the studies. We still don't know if it um, reduces mortality if people die less. Okay, so it was given to some to people that shortened their duration, but the, the mortality rates um, we don't know yet. And and like whether it helps people on their on respirators and things. So we're hopeful. Okay, so that's the other big thing in treatment from a conventional perspective. The whole you know um, convalescent serum, which is people donating blood that had it, is still happening and hot to trot. Um, I don't think in the moment, like this week, there was nothing new that I haven't talked about, like in terms of studies that, you know, came out that were very promising. I think that those are the two big things, which are very good, right? So the vaccine story is really good. We just have to see how it unfolds. And remdesivir is really good. We have to see how that unfolds. I think those are the two most promising things, as well as, um, um, you know, as well as the convalescent serum, which we're making more and more of, and it seems to be good. Okay, so that's in the treatment world. In the integrative world of treatment, um, you know, uh, people have been emailing me about Christina Cuomo, you know, and her whole story. And I will say that her vitamin regimen looked pretty good to me, but I, I, I've never heard of soaking, putting Clorox in your bath. So don't do that, okay? That's not the most effective way for detoxification. For those of you who have worked with me all these years or know functional medicine, you don't, chlorine absorbed through your skin is not so, not good. It's terrible for your thyroid. I can't imagine that's good for, um, I, I don't recommend it. Okay. The rest of what she talked about is fine, but the Clorox, no. Um, but she talked about uh, thing, interesting things like uh, nebulized glutathione or glutathione. Um, and so that's, you know, totally spot on. Um, and and interesting, as we're learning what's going on in the body, it sort of helps direct what we think could work, right? So I'm going to hold, just pause for a second. I want to go to, I want to switch to the understanding that's evolving about what the virus is doing in the body. And then we'll talk about some supplements, okay? Because they're relevant. Because by understanding the underlying problem, you can think about what you might want to do. And so... Um, and so what we're learning, very interesting stuff, and a lot of you have posted, we talked about this last week as well, this idea of, you know, is it really attacking the lungs? Is it really like acute respiratory distress syndrome? Is, are the ventilator settings the right ones? This has been a debate in the whole medical world. And so more and more doctors are sort of writing in and, and small sort of um, case studies and case studies and a lot of discussion in the medical journals about what's really going on in the body. And it really, and it's so, it's very interesting because it looks like it's not the same as high altitude pulmonary edema. It looks like there's definitely a problem with enough oxygenation in the blood, and that there's not enough, um, and that people their the oxygen levels drop in people really quickly. You know that pulse ox that you read about says get one of those pulse oximeters and measure your sort of blood oxygen levels, and. Um, and so you can see if it drops, you go to the hospital, right? So that's sort of this thing. And so there's an understanding that your oxygenation drops, and that's a sign that you're sort of taking a turn for the worse. So the question is, though, why is it dropping? And the thought was that it's because your lungs aren't working. That was initially that it's a respiratory virus, your lungs aren't working. But now there's a couple of other theories going on, right? So one article I read was about, I'm sure you've all read about this idea that young people are having strokes and there's this concern about um, clotting, that the blood is clotting in some people. And so now the concern is that maybe the blood flow 
it's there's a clotting issue and the blood is not it, like the capillaries in the lungs are sort of getting congested from the blood side not from the sort of alveoli side not from the lung side but more from the, where the blood's flowing through the lungs because it's tiny 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 little capillaries and that's why all these organs seem to be getting involved there's a problem of the blood flow through the capillaries and so is the blood flowing enough to pick up the oxygen and so that's one of the first things and so there are some people out there looking at using some blood thinning you know medication and these are early early sort of ideas right the other big thing is whether or not there's a problem in the red blood cells that carry the oxygen and and if whether or not some of them are rupturing and we're seeing some sort of a damage that the virus is infecting or damaging the red blood cells and actually there's an interesting um correlation with that and um and plaquenil because plaquenil malaria which is the classic um, infection that damages red blood cells and causes them to burst and impairs their ability to carry oxygen. That's why people get so sick with malaria um, also because their oxygen levels can drop is that um, Plaquenil sort of helps helps the red blood cells. And so there's, there is this, and, and so, but we're, what we are trying to understand and learning about Plaquenil is that it has a, one of the ways it works, the way Plaquenil works is it, it helps zinc get into the red blood cells. And this is why you've all been hearing about zinc, right? The reason why zinc is so fabulous is because it really, um, besides being antiviral in its own way and great for the immune system, we're wondering whether zinc helps, helps sort of get the plaquenil or the plaquenil gets the zinc. It's actually not, it's the plaquenil helps get the zinc in, right? So plaquenil seems to be only working when you make sure the person has enough zinc in their body. And the zinc is what helps the red blood cells work better. So these are all, all these people are talking about this. There's the most brilliant minds in the world are on this. And I'm reading like from every sort of medical organization. I get my newsletters every day, you know, like every day. And I'm reading all these um, op-eds and opinions and, and case studies. And so there's something going on with zinc and there's something going on with the red blood cells. And so, as I suspect from what I'm, I'm sort of reading, and maybe that's the Plaquenil connection. So that's what I was trying to say about that. And so, wait one second. Oh, the heat just went on. That happens every Friday. Well, maybe it's a timing thing. Turn, putting up my window. All right, before I get hot. I'm, I'm through menopause. I don't get hot flashes, but the heat just flicked on. And so all of a sudden it blows up from my desk. <laughs> okay. And I did go out and walk this morning. So I am a little sort of um, warm, you know, in general from working out. Okay. So, um, so that's that. So I want to talk about that. So which brings me then to supplements and then we're going to move on to my que all the questions. Um, and so this is where why, one of the reasons zinc is so good um, we think because of the way it works on this virus and all viruses, but also it's um, immune supporting, it stabilizes the red blood cells as well as it's good for white blood cells and your immune system. But um, because the, you know, we think that part of the way the virus causes this damage to the oxygen carrying capacity in the blood is this thing called oxidative stress. And oxidative stress is just too much free radicals running around. You can think of it as reactive oxygen species, depending on you know how not how much knowledge you have for these kind of um, these kind of terms. But I like to tell people it's sort of like all well, the sparks that always arise in the body, and we're always taking antioxidants to put out the sparks. And the virus causes just a lot of a lot of these sparks, which is apparently causing problems with its the oxygen carrying capacity as well as potentially in the lungs, right? And so that's why vitamin C is so good. And so there's two more studies came out in the past couple of days on vitamin C. They're, they're adopting it in the hospital. If you're not taking vitamin C, you absolutely must. Um, increased, reduced um, time in the ICU and people that got vitamin C, and they were just given one to six grams a day, 1,000 to 6,000 milligrams of vitamin C a day. So you really should be able to take... Um, at least, you know, somewhere in the one to three, I tell people one to three grams a day of vitamin C, and then just up the dose if you get sick. But vitamin C, besides being antiviral all by itself, there's, they're using it and it's being studied and it, and, it, and it shows an effect in a good way. And so there's no reason not to do it. So 
vitamin C, if you're only doing one thing, and I say this every week, but the news is there's a, there were a few more studies that came out this week validating the importance of vitamin C. Um, I saw someone talking about hyperbaric oxygen uh, therapy, and I'm hoping maybe someone's going to do that, right? Because what you go in a hyperbaric oxygen chamber, and it pushes, uh, it, pre it it's 100% oxygen, so it really pushes the oxygen in. Um, so I would love to see um, more, like someone really look at look at that and see whether or not it works. Um, I think that's really the only additional things I wanted to talk about. This quercetin is being studied. Somebody sent me that over, you know, after my talk last week. Quercetin is in the middle of being studied. It's a really good antioxidant. It might have some antiviral properties. Um, it, there's very little downside to adding it, um, but it hasn't, the studies aren't conclusive yet, but it makes sense that it, it could easily work. And we know that the body has oxidative stress and, and in at least um, it appears that that should be a helpful thing to add. But again, it is, and it is being studied right now. So I will add that quercetin is being studied. Um, and I hope somebody studies glutathione, nebulize glutathione, which means you inhale it. It like mists and then you inhale it into the lungs. I don't think somebody wrote me in yesterday about um, this whole idea about nebulizers. I'm not against nebulizers at all. Somebody had asked me about a CPAP machine many, many weeks ago. And that's different than, than actually a nebulizer where you're inhaling something really good for the lungs. And so nebulized glutathione could be really an amazing uh, option to try, but I haven't seen any, it's, it's just theoretically, it makes sense, right? So it makes sense given what we know. But I think that definitely intravenous vitamin C and intravenous glutathione would be great. And so if you, especially um, if, you're, if you're sick, you know, but even to protect yourself. And once Blum Center opens again, which I'm hoping to be back in the office June 1st. So my goal is to open June 1st in a limited way. I'm only going to have one of us clinicians um, in the office at a time to limit how many people are in the waiting room and all that. But, but it seems to me that as a service, I really need to, I really need to get my IV room open again, you know, to get, to allow people the opportunity of getting the IVs in because IV vitamin C and IV glutathione are both powerful treatments for, for this, you know, for COVID and for preventing, for um, just to keep your antioxidant levels really high, okay? So let me see if I have any little other notes for myself. That's really it. I'm gonna go to questions now. That's my um, rant for the day and I'm under, good, I did it in 23 minutes. Um, I'm gonna go to my questions. I see somebody posted something one person did put something, oh, there's the dog, because somebody's dropping off. Okay. Excuse us. Um, my dog's going to make a little fuss for a second. Um, so first question, do you think coronavirus was man-made and got released in a lab <laughs> accident in, um, in China? Well, here's the thing. Um, I'm sorry. I, th I think that's a conspiracy theory. So I don't know that I, I'm not like a, I'm not a secret spy that I would actually be able to hundred percent answer that question. Um, but wait one second, let me just make sure. Sorry, I just got, oh, there it is. Okay, we're good. Um, little noise in my house. There's a, there's a delivery. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have that. My dog is going crazy, but that'll be done in a second. So, 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 so just have, take a minute with me while the noise goes away. One second, one second. All right, I muted myself while I yelled my dog's name. <laughs> that's Trixie. All right, Trixie, that's enough. All right, so coming back. Um, so we know from past viruses that viruses go, these viruses are from animals. They are. The, 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 um, we believe HIV, MERS, SARS, the previous ones have been traced to animals. And it's a common thing that happens where it jumps from the animal to human. They're pretty certain it's from bats. But you know, I still think it's pretty gross that people are eating bats or selling bats in a wild market. Like who needs to be having, I mean, shame on them, you know, for having these strange, you know, animals that are, have potential contagious stuff in them in a market where there are humans, 
right? And so that's how it, it jumped from the animals to us. It's still shame on them, you know, because who needs to have bats in a, in a market? Okay, sorry. So, so, but I don't believe it was in a, I don't, I don't believe it was in a, in a lab. Um, all right, so I'm going to remind everyone, please put your questions in the chat. Um, this is the second question that went up into the Q&A. Um, questions, are gonna, I'm going to open the chat next. Um, so somebody asked about supplements for everyday use. I'm going to come back to that after I go, because I'm sure there's more questions in terms of supplements, okay? So I'm going to start at the top now um, in the chat box, all right? And by the way, if you're posting a question in the chat box, and you want me, you don't want people to see your name, then just write it, it'll say two and the two, you can have a little drop down menu, say two, all panelists, that's just me. You have the option to do panelists and everyone and attendees, and then everyone will see your question, which is sort of nice. So unless you don't want anyone to see your name, just send, make sure you're doing the message to everybody. Okay. When a vaccine is developed, will it be a live virus? If so, can someone with autoimmune diseases get the vaccine? The one that they're developing is not a live virus. That I'm, I'm pretty certain it's not a live virus. Um, so I don't. Um, so that's a different question than people with autoimmune getting the vaccine. I think that the concern about people with autoimmune getting vaccines is, in a, it's because a vaccine by nature is going to stress your immune system. It's going to give you something that's going to trigger an immune reaction, and because it you um, we want to make sure that we have a really robust immune response what happens is they use something called adjuvants in the in the vaccine and it's usually aluminum um, and then often there's mercury as a preservative uh, in thimerosal what are you eating my dog likes to eat paper so she goes in the garbage and she shreds paper i mean I think she might have an anxiety disorder. I've got to give her some. I have doggy CBD. I forget to give it to her. Anyway, and now that we're all living home under quarantine, I think she needs it a lot more. I think she's gotten more anxious. Anyway, she's busy chewing paper under my desk. But coming back to, uh, to getting the, 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 a vaccine if you have autoimmunity, I tend to not favor getting over-vaccinated. Um, but in this case, I think because this is a disease that is potentially deadly. And until we know more about it or have a really good treatment so that if you get it, it's mild, um, then I'm probably going to recommend the vaccine for most people. Now, if you're on a immune suppressant medicine, you might not respond to the vaccine. So that's actually a problem you have to talk to your rheumatologist about because, or whoever's managing your meds, because um, I mean, it's not always a rheumatologist, right? Like if you have MS, you have a neurologist who's doing it. And so um, if you're on very strong immune suppressing medications, the concern is that you actually won't make antibodies because your immune system is suppressed. <sighs> so it's a bit of a conundrum. So once we know, once come back here and we'll talk about vaccines and what to do about it once we see exactly what the vaccine is and we see what kind of treatments we have out there to see, and we'll, let's just see how deadly the virus still is. Because right now it's very unpredictable. We don't really understand it and it's deadly. And so I'm going to be, I, I'm going to get the vaccine at this moment, based upon what I know, if it was right now and the vaccine I knew was really safe and it was effective in preventing getting the, the virus, I probably would get it. Um, and I don't get the, I haven't been getting the flu vaccine. I'm actually thinking twice about that this year. Um, I'm turning 60 actually next month. And I'm thinking maybe the time has come for me to start getting the flu vaccine, which I haven't gotten all these years because you know, I'm not in a risk category that I would die from the flu. But, you know, this whole thing is going to make us rethink the, these things. And their vaccines are there for a reason. And if we need them, we need them. So let, let's have that in an ongoing way when we have more information, because I don't know exactly what the vaccine is yet. And we don't know if there's other treatments for the virus and, and how, you know, the risk and benefit. You always have to weigh the risks with the benefits. And right now, the benefits would be so great because of the mortality rate from the, you know, because of the unknown about who dies from the, or gets really sick from the virus, so that you have to weigh the risks and benefits. Um, uh, I have heard that I should wait to do an antibody test because they are not yet reliable. What do I think? All right, well, that's a good question about just the antibody testing. 
Um, I've been going through that a lot because you, as you guys know, we've been doing antibody testing for a few weeks. I told you all here, I think two weeks ago that I was going to start doing antibody tests in the office. I think I started even three weeks ago with my team because I had a quick test. I have a quick test in the office that you can do yourself in 15 minutes. You can see if it's positive. And so I've been, I've been actually doing three different companies and comparing the results for the past couple of weeks. And I've tested a whole bunch of patients as well. I think antibody testing, you have to make sure it's a reliable company. And so you have to make sure that you're getting it done by, it's ordered or you're getting it done by somebody that um, can, can recommend it. Uh, and so the two companies, so what's happened this week, since I saw you last, is LabCorp, actually last week, Quest was doing it in their office. This week, LabCorp is now, now offering the antibody test and LabCorp um, and, and Quest has a direct consumer test. So you can actually go, it's called like Quest Direct and you can actually go on their website and you can pay like $115 out of pocket and get the test yourself without even needing your doctor to order it. So I'm not, you know, so now because it's accessible, it's widely accessible, I am not giving antibody tests anymore to people who are not my current patients. So my patients, I'm happy to order it for you. Um, but if you're not my patient and you want to get a test, you can now get it from Quest Direct. So that's how I would suggest you go do it. Um, Quest and LabCorp have been gotten um, approval from the government. So they were on the daily federal national briefing, um, introducing the reps from Quest and LabCorp, telling them they're now going to be doing antibody testing. I do believe antibody testing from uh, a lab who has low false positives and low false negatives. And that's really how you decide whether a test is good or not. And so I think you just have to be careful who's doing the test. I think Quest and LabCorp are both fine. So for me, I've sent the blood to Quest, KBMO, which is who I've been using for the, they have a finger stick kit if anybody wants that to send to their home. Um, I believe it's safe to go back to LabCorp and Quest. They're actually being very careful. You can wait in your car um, and they'll text you when it's time to come in. Um, so I, there's a whole safe way to go to the lab now. And you can go to the lab and you can get an antibody test. Uh, I, I have found it's very valid. So, it, so you have to take it in the context of the story. So in my people who were sick or appeared to be sick, um, the tests are all aligning. So I've been doing the KBMO and the Quest together to see whether or not they're, they're, they're coming out the same for, for everyone. And those two teams seem to always be the same, which is really good. The quick test that I got from China that's in my office, that one is not so reliable. That one, I had some false positives. I had two of my, my staff were a little positive on that, but they were negative in Quest and KBMO. So I've decided for my own in-house testing that the quick one that I'm using, that I bought this one kit from someone who imported it from China, um, that one I don't trust. And so I think there are definitely antibody tests you can trust out there. And I've decided which ones that I trust. So I do trust Quest, I do trust LabCorp, and I do trust KBMO, which is the company that I'm doing, um, that, I, that for those people who don't want to go to the lab, we can send a finger stick to your house. Um, and they were out of the gate last week or two weeks. They were out of the gate before Quest and LabCorp, okay? So here's the other thing about antibody testing. First, you have to make sure the company is um, not having too many false positives, meaning it says you're positive, but you're really not, or false negatives. It says you're negative, but you're really not. And actually the false negatives have been a huge problem for COVID testing, right? So in the hospitals, there've been so many people who are so sick and they say, test is negative, okay? False negative. Um, and so you have to take the whole picture. Were you exposed? Were you with someone who was exposed? Um, you know, do you, were you with someone who was sick? Were you sick? You know, it has to, the story has to make sense. Yes, there's all these people, it seems, that have positive testing that, um, never showed any symptoms. And, um, but on a population level, when you interpret it, when you do thousands and thousands and thousands of these tests or millions of these tests, you start to, you could, the data, the statistics, which tell you there's a percentage that are going to be false positive and false negative always in every test you do. You just want that to be very, very small. And so I think, um, so again, uh, I, I'm, I'm trusting Quest and LabCorp, but I'm also making sure I understand the patient's story. And then the other thing is, Quest and LabCorp are only testing IgG. 
it takes about three weeks solid. I would say you should even wait four weeks. You should wait four weeks since you were exposed, where you were with someone who got sick, you were sick yourself, before you go and do the IgG test, because that's the late antibody that rises. That's the one that confers immunity, and so that we believe confers immunity. So if you go too soon, if you go like the second week after you were sick, then the test is going to be negative because you didn't give it time. And so wait at least a month, and that will increase the likelihood that, you'll, that your antibodies, you'll pick them up. Um, what type of approval does the company you use for antibody test having? Well, Quest and LabCorp, I believe, have emergency FDA approval. So that's, that. they're the national lab. KBMO, the, that one is, um, that one has Chinese FDA approval, Chinese CDC. It's the number one that they, KBMO uses a test from China. Um, and I've seen all of the, the statistics for that. And it has a very low false negative and very low false positive rate. Um, they have all the credentials in China, uh, and it's apparently the number one test that was recommended there. They do not have FDA approval here in the U.S. There's only like a couple of companies that do, um, and they weren't vetted here in the U.S., but they have a submission here for the FDA. But again, now that Quest and LabCorp are online, there's no reason to necessarily do the KBMO unless you want to, but I'm finding it's the same, and I do try, and I read all their stuff, and I think that... Um, just because they don't have FDA approval here or emergency FDA approval, you know, as we've all noticed, our federal government has not done a great job helping us figure out the testing, you know, um, or getting the tests done in a way. And so the fact they don't have FDA approval doesn't bother me as long as I'm, I can see the data and I can see that it's a good test. How long do the finger prick tests you're sending out selling to your patients take to come back? You send it in, and as soon as the lab gets it, you get the results the next day. So you do it at home, you set, ship it that day, they get it the next day, so you'll find out the following day. So two days. Yeah. Um, do you have any thoughts about structured water? I don't know what structured water is. So you're going to have to explain that one to me. So add that at the bottom of the questions, and we'll get there. Um, on the same subject of antibody tests, heard that Quest and LabCorp tests cannot distinguish whether immunity is from COVID or other viruses. That's not true. No. Okay. So here's the thing. That's called specificity and sensitivity. Okay. A test has to be sensitive enough so it'll pick it up. Um, and so you set the bar and then it has to be specific enough so that you, you're getting coronavirus, this COVID coronavirus but this one, COVID-19. And so all of these tests, if it's a really, really close cousin, like coronavirus one, this is coronavirus two, if you happen to have that coronavirus, it might overlap, but it's not all viruses. So there is a little bit of a false positive that you can get some of the, some of the tests. This is the problem and why there's been a big controversy about the antibody test, that it's not specific enough for this particular coronavirus. That's not my experience about LabCorp and Quest, there's a, but there's a statistic. I think it's like 3%. So 3% of the time, three people out of 100, it might be a false positive. Let's just pick that as the number. I don't know what the exact number is, but the test cannot be approved as the FDA won't approve it unless this percentage of the time that it crosses over to another coronavirus is very small. So that's called false positive. So the false positives have to be below a certain number or the test is not gonna be approved and you can't do it. Um, and so it seems to me that from what I've read is that Quest and LabCorp are both valid enough that I am using that test. Thanks for doing these Friday sessions. They're very helpful. I'm having construction done in my house and I'm living in a rental. They rescheduled installation of kitchen cabinets because two installers were sick. No specifics. If I stay out of the house after cabinets are installed and don't touch painted wood cabinets for a week, does that allow the virus bacteria to die? Yes. And then the other thing is you go in with a mask on and you just wipe everything down and you're good. Okay. I think that'll be just fine. Back to testing companies, is CFDA really a good standard to look at? Is that China FDA? I think so. Really good standard to look at. I've been in touch with KBMO, who I use for food sensitivity, but not US FDA approved, and many questions about cross-reactivity. 
It's the same questions about cross-reactivity that every test company has. All I can tell you is that um, I have tested a whole bunch of people now and it all makes sense to me. So I did a whole family. Um, one family member had the virus and, and COVID was COVID positive and we knew that. Out of his whole family, he's the only one that had antibodies. The rest of the family was negative, even though they were in the house with him. So, but he did test positive, everybody else was negative. And I, we tested like six people. Um, that was one, that's actually, that, that actually happened in several families. Um, another family, we picked up um, one of the kids and like the husband and one of the kids. No, actually it was the husband, wife and one of the kids, but they were sick. They made sense that they were positive. You know, the illness was, um, was very, co was COVID, but it was back in January, February, and we were wondering, right? So in the absence, so just always remember when you do a test, it has to make clinical sense. If you have a positive test and you were not sick, okay, and those are the false positive people, if you never had anything and you're one of those people they, that theoretically could be an asymptomatic positive person, then I would say that you probably want to take that antibody test, maybe with a grain of salt, if you were never sick. If you had, if you had COVID symptoms or you had any kind of you know, illness that, could be, that has any of the COVID symptoms on the list and you're positive, then it would make sense, right? Um, if, you're, if you do the antibody test and, or you lived in the house with someone who had it, if you lived in the house with, um, or if, if no one in your house was sick and you were never sick, and you tested everyone in the house and everyone's negative, but you're positive, that might be a question mark in my mind. Yeah, maybe that's a false positive. You see what I'm saying? So randomly, there are going to be some false positives on every test. Do you know that's true of the test you do in the lab for anything? Every single test has, a, it's called sensitivity and specificity. That's how sensitive it is to pick it up and how specific it is. Are you going to find it? You know, you want to make sure that it's very specific for just that virus. But the more specific it is, you lose some sensitivity. You'll end up with more false negatives, right? So false negatives and false positives are like a trade-off when people develop a test. And there's always a little bit of each. So there's not going to be a test that's 100%. And that's where someone like me comes in. So if you do the test and you are confused about the results and you're not sure if you should believe it, let's talk about it, right? For some of you, if there's 100 people on this call, there's going to be one or two of you that are going to have a false positive test. And, and chances are it's going to be somebody who was asymptomatic. You never were sick, but maybe your spouse was sick and you want to know if you had it. Well, if you're positive um, and you never were sick, you know, we might want to retest you as the tests get even better. So I hope that helps. Um, I think that even with these sort of concerns and confusions about the testing, I do still think that about the results, I still think it's really, really helpful for the majority of you. If you were sick and you had COVID, you want to know if you developed antibodies. If you were around a family member who had COVID or you were sick and you don't know if it was COVID and you want, you want to do the antibody testing, you want to see if it's positive. If it makes sense, for 98% of you, 95, 98% of you, that test is going to be real, a real positive. Um, for, for the, if, if it doesn't make, you know, if you're positive and you never were sick, you know, then we can talk about maybe redoing the test later on, the possibility it's a false positive. But chances are you won't have a false positive twice in a row, right? Because it's like a crapshoot. It's an odds thing. And so, um, and so we'll see. Right. So that's, um, but I, but I think for the overwhelming majority of people, I think it's more likely that you're going to be negative than you're going to be positive. And I think getting a negative test is really helpful. Um, there are some false negatives, but the false negatives are much lower and not as much of a concern. So if you go and get the test, let's flip it that way and just say, you know what, if you're negative, that's great news. Not, maybe not great news. Maybe you want to be positive, but if it's negative, that tells you something. If it's negative, you're negative. And that means you did either didn't make antibodies to the COVID or you actually never had it and you're vulnerable. So you do want to know if you're negative. And so I do think the test is very helpful, but it requires interpretation. All right, enough of that. Um, uh, where am I? Would hot tubs also be bad for your thyroid if they use bromine and not bleach? Good question. 
Um, you know, tough one, right? Bromide can get absorbed through the skin and, and affect your thyroid as well. What I'll say about, and I, so I still think bromide's better than chloride um, for, the, for the hot tub. And actually that's what we use in our hot tub. But I, I think it's really important that everyone takes a, a supplement that has iodine in it. Don't forget, it's just going to compete with the iodine. So you want to make sure that you're having iodized salt every day or you're taking a multimineral or a multivitamin that has iodine in it. And so you want, if, you're, if you're insufficient or iodine or you're iodine deficiency, then we've got a problem and then your thyroid will take those things up. So just make sure you're eating plenty of iodine. And it's the same thing when we have that conversation about eating soy and eating um, goitrogens, you know, too much soy that, that holds on to iodine or a goitrogen or, you know, raw kale, right? Goitrogens are foods that um, basically bind the iodine so that your thyroid can't get it. And so I always just tell people, make sure you're, you're eating iodine during the day, and whether it's a supplement or whether it's an iodized salt, and, um, and take that when you're not eating one of those foods that might hold on to the iodine, and then your thyroid will get it. So just make sure you're doing enough iodine. Um, we're taking supplements from Healing Arthritis book, excellent, and have difficulty swallowing, and reddish tongue. Could one of the supplements cause this? We did chew the vitamin C tablet, which may have had sharp edges, caused scratches. So your tongue got red after, um, after chewing the vitamins. I don't really know. Um, how about, so I, I don't know. So here's, here's my, anytime it, so this is actually going to apply to all of you. And first of all, remember, I'm not giving you medical advice, right? This is just a conversation. This is an education forum. This is not medical advice. Anytime um, you think, anytime you take supplements and you think you might have a side effect, something happens, like your tongue got red or something weird happened, I, the first rule of thumb is stop everything or stop what the new thing you added or what you think might be causing the problem. Just stop it or stop everything. Wait a few days until whatever the side effect is goes away. And in your case, till your tongue is normal and then do it again. And this time do one at a time and see which one is the culprit. Otherwise there's no way to know which one it is. Um, certainly it's possible something in that you chewed in that supplement, you know, cause a, it could be a food sensitivity reaction, it, a red tongue, swollen tongue. It also um, ha, could have sort of dyed your tongue. I don't know. It might have something in it. Like a, like I think about turmeric, you know, it's um, turmeric is very, um, it's orange, you know, maybe that'll make the tongue red. Anyway, you have to do your own detective work. So stop everything and try again and see which one is the, is the culprit. You mentioned nebulized glutathione. How does that work? What about nebulized hydrogen peroxide? Um, I don't know about hydrogen peroxide. Um, I have read, I, there's some discussion, not in this context about hydrogen peroxide. I think I've, um, I've seen hydrogen peroxide IVs, I believe, for like viral illnesses in general. Um, but hydrogen peroxide would be more of an oxidizer, you know, to kill the virus as opposed to an antioxidant, right? That you're, you're, you're looking to help support the body's antioxidant system. Hydrogen peroxide doesn't do that. I think that's, that would be for the purpose of killing the virus. Um, so how does nebulized glutathione work? It's actually, you have to get a nebulizer and it's actually, so it's a gadget that you have to get. And then you get, I believe it's a car, some sort of cartridge, but it's, I, I have to order that from a compounding pharmacy. Um, it's not something that's a prescription or that you can get over the counter. And, um, and so, so it's a nebulizer, which brings, um, which, which makes the glutathione aerosolized and then you inhale it. And so there's a whole process that the pharmacy has to help set you up with. Um, and then you inhale it. And so therefore, then the glutathione goes straight to the lungs. And glutathione is really a hard um, molecule to absorb. It's made of three, I think I've told you guys this before, it's made of three amino acids, glutamine, glycine, and cysteine. And so if you just take a pill of glutathione, it breaks up into the three amino acids in your stomach. And so you need to find a way to get glutathione into the body in high amounts um, in a way that's not just a regular pill. So there are a lot of companies that have figured out how to uh, give, make liposomal glutathione. So there's some that's oral liposomal. That's another good way to do it, to get it into the body. 
So oral liposomal, um, IV, or um, nebulized is just a way to get it past the stomach and directly into the body. And if the lungs have a lot of oxidative stress, then you're actually helping the lungs by doing that. Um, let's see. Do you think coronavirus is man-made? Oh, somebody asked me that already. How much zinc should we be taking? Is that how zinc picolinates? Is that, oh, so um, I say somewhere between 15 and 30, 15 and 50 even. Um, I think it'd be fine to take 50 for a short period of time, you know, for a period of time, um, especially if you're not getting it in other vitamins. So you can take anywhere from 15 to 50 of zinc. Um, and so, and it's a kind of level we could measure, you know, at some point, but, um, but sometimes it's in a multi, if you have it in your multi, you're good. Most multis are going to have it. Uh, and so 15 to 30 is a good, just everyday dose. Um, but I've seen people and I've seen it recommended up to 50. Um, zinc picolinate is a great option. Uh, zinc is usually chelated to something. And so, um, that would be fine. What do you think about news about children are safer and grandparents can hug them? Um, can we see them with masks? Oh, so there were these stories about children uh, hugging the grandparents. Um, the, I, um, I still think that hugs probably, if everybody's been quarantined, then if everyone's home, um, you can, like I have my four of us in the house, we could hug each other. We've all been here for seven weeks. so. If everybody's been quarantined, that's fine. But if the children are out and about or have not been quarantined and they're going to go see grandma or grandpa, um, then I wouldn't have them hug because even if they are, they might be asymptomatic and they might be carriers. They're not sick, but they could have the virus on them. So if you're older um, and you're a high risk group, then you do not want to hug anybody that, um, that is, that has not been quarantined for at least a month like you. Okay. Um, and I say a month because especially someone who's sick for sure, but someone who never had it and never had exposure to anyone who had it, you're probably good for two weeks. Um, but they're saying, you know, there's random, it's not usual. Usually the virus is gone within three weeks after being sick, but there's some people where it lingers longer. And even though it's lingering longer, we still don't even know if that means that they can, they're contagious, that they would give it to someone just because there might be a few random virus particles in their nose. It's a very confusing thing. And remember, it's May 1st, right? So we're still trying to figure a lot of stuff out. Um, what amount of zinc? I already said anything new on elderberry. Yeah, I'm telling people to take elderberry. Um, but if you got sick, I'm, you know, I like elderberry. It, the, the, the idea of stopping elderberry is very theoretical. So I think my guess is you're probably safe to stay on elderberry. It's a really great immune support supplement. Um, but until we know better, um, you know, I, you're probably better off stopping the elderberry if you got COVID. Um, but take it now as a preventive. Should I take glutathione supplement if I have COPD and how much? Yeah. Um, Yes, and I don't really know how much to tell you to take. You're gonna to have to find someone to prescribe it anyway. If you have COPD, actually, that would be a very interesting thing to give you um, in a nebulized form. Um, there's oral, um, you can get liposomal glutathione on Amazon or wherever, and usually it's just a teaspoon a day of the, of the liposomal glutathione, and that would be good for systemic, and, that, and that's, that's just plain good for you. Um, it's, it's sort of expensive though. So, I mean, I would say you might not want to do it forever. I usually, you know, this is, we're talking about, these are extraordinary times, but glutathione could be pretty expensive. Um, testing update, I did it. Where would you prioritize? Oh, the, the only other thing about testing update is that um, pretty soon, and actually there's a company that I work with that's coming out with a saliva COVID test. The saliva is going to turn out to be much better and lower rate of false negatives, right? Because the nasal swab is very dependent on how well you swab yourself. The saliva is looking like it's 100% um, you know, sensitive and specific. Um, and so uh, look for the saliva test coming out for COVID that you can do yourself at home. It'll be much easier. Um, so that, that's what's coming out next. Um, where would you prioritize curcumin in the list of vitamins to take? I would put, I would put curcumin somewhere in the middle, middle to the top. Um, it's really good for reducing this inflammasome, which is the cytokine storm that we talked about, this NLRP3 inflammasome that gets amped up. Um, 
at the end of when people get really sick. And so it'll keep, it helps keep the train from running away, right? It's a good anti-inflammatory as well as an antioxidant. So turmeric is super good. Um, are you okay with the WHO protocol as to treating corona in hospitals? There's a lot of controversy around it. Um, I, I'm not really, I sort of talked about that at the beginning. There's a lot of, um, there's a, all the hospitals actually are doing a lot of different things. So there's not really one WHO protocol. The hospitals are using, um, they're using convalescent serum. They're using remdesivir. Some of them are using Plaquenil in the randomized trial, which honestly is not turning out to be so great. And it might be that it's because there's a zinc issue that's confounding it. Um, and they're all trying to use the IL-6, you know, the anti, uh, they're, they're all doing different things. But so the WHO, there's a protocol, but, and then there's the whole thing about the, um, the settings to use for the ventilators. And I have to say that I read this article about this guy in Germany, this intensivist, a pulmonologist who's, who's been managing his own ICU in this hospital in Germany. And he, not one person has died because he's using completely different ventilator settings than everyone else. And he's not in intubating everyone and no one has died yet. And he's, he moved to the bigger hospital in Germany so that he could do a randomized trial to prove that he thinks his approach works. So um, I don't think everyone's doing one who, you know, I think everyone's doing different stuff actually. And people are busy measuring it and trying to test it and share it. And there's a lot of sharing going on about this. And I think in another month, we're going to really understand how to treat people um, to prevent them from dying in the ICU um, much better. Um, I think we're on the cusp of a big breakthrough with understanding that. Um, so um, I did the antibody test and I came back negative for IgG and IgM. I wasn't sure what result I was hoping for, but I'm grateful for having this information and knowing that I haven't been an asymptomatic transmitter. Thank you. That's a good point. Are there any other conclusions I can draw for this? No, no, Lauren, I, you're, you were negative. I think you should go with that. You were, you were asymptomatic. You never had it. So you're negative and you can, you can get it again. And that's really what the conclusion for you to draw. So it's a good example of somebody who would be, it would be helpful for them to get, you know, th that's information from the test that I think you can believe in that's helpful. Mushrooms originally heard to avoid polysaccharide extracts like immunotics and only use full mushroom extracts of maitake. Yes, yes, yes. Is that because the polysaccharide extracts are too potent and therefore are these cautionary thoughts still valid? So, so the question is about, you know, uh, natural killer boosters um, with mushrooms. And what I'll say about that, Marla, is that um, it's theoretical, right? So all these things really are just theoretical. Um, it's the question is, if you do the extracts, which are that much more potent, let's say, could you increase the cytokine storm? And it's just a could you. And so, um, and so I, don't, I, don't, um, I don't know that I can answer you in a definitive way that's going to, um, based upon any research. What I can say is that mushrooms are the one, like, especially like the one you're, 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 um, you're talking about like the polysaccharide itself as an extract, like Zymogen's product. Um, th those are very potent and really good at the beginning of an illness, like to prevent for prevention. And if you came across, if you bump into the virus, you want your natural killers to clear that baby out as fast as it can. So your initial immune response, when you bump into the virus, the more robust it is, the less likely you're going to get sick. The cytokine storm happens from uncontrolled replication of the virus in your body that ends up overwhelming your immune system. If you're taking any kind of mushrooms, including immunotics, you're going to, at the, especially prevention, and if you're getting sick or you, you notice you have a little symptoms and you take it, it's going to prevent the, the sort of onslaught or the, it's going to reduce the likelihood you're going to end up in a cytokine storm. And so, um, you're going to have to use your own judgment on that if you got really sick. And then if you got really sick, whether or not to stop it, it's just theoretical. It was really the folks at University of Arizona Integrative Medicine, the Andy Wild group who put out that caution. And so I transmitted it. I think um, I'm taking immune mushrooms every day. Um, I do do more of an extract versus immunotics. And so, um, you know, up to you if you want to stick with the polysaccharide or if you want to go to the immunotics, I think you're probably fine. 
Um, and the chances of you end up, uh, by the time anyone's in cytokine storm, you're way down the road. And so if, if God, you know, God forbid that happened to anyone listening, you know, um, then those things like the, like those just two things, the elderberry and perhaps the really intensive, you know, extracts of the, of the polysaccharides um, of the mushrooms, you might want to consider stopping, but um, I have no research to back that up. Only theory. All right. But for now you're good. Right. And it's, and, and I definitely recommend it. Um, for those of you who want to take a whole bunch of things. All right. So this is where I get the emails. There's eight things you recommended. Do I need to take all of them? And you don't unless you want to. Okay. And that's why I prioritize zinc, vitamin C, and a probiotic. Those are the three. Right. And then beyond that, you can move to things like, um, you can move to things like the, like mushrooms you can move to you know mushroom extract, natural killer boosters like that. You can move to things like um, you know astragalus echinacea, um, and you can move to things like um, it's the other A, and I'm blanking out. Um, but other herbal stuff that that supports the immune function, you can add into that. Um, quercetin, you can add into that, um, and so you can start N acetylcysteine. Which, by the way, we talked about glutathione. Glutathione is really hard to take. Like I said. But cheap and easy is NAC, N-acetylcysteine. You take NAC, it increases your body's glutathione. So that's actually the most common supplement I give. And so for the lady with COPD who asked me the question, easy peasy, you should start taking N-acetylcysteine. But I'm not giving you medical advice. It's just an idea, okay? So it's called N-acetylcysteine. What I use, I use Designs for Health. I think it's like 900 milligrams in a capsule. You take one capsule a day. It'll help support. It's, and it's good for your lungs, um, and it's good for the lungs. And acetylcysteine actually comes, that's a prescription you can get. It's called mucomist. And if, if for those of you with kids with asthma, you might've gotten that prescription from your pediatrician and it's a nebulizer and you give them NAC and it's mucomist and it um, helps increase the glutathione locally in the lungs. So that's another idea. Um, yeah. How do you protect against kidney stones? Could extra supplements to protect against COVID cause kidney stones? My husband feels like he's getting kidney stones. All right. Interesting you say that. So I upped my vitamin C by a thousand about a week ago. And I swear, I feel like on my back, I'm like, oh my God, am I getting a kidney stone? So I'm prone to that as well. Since I've been a vegan, I don't get kidney stones anymore. So the more animal, so vitamin C. So vitamin C, maybe it acidifies the urine a little bit and that's why. So I added more vitamin C and I think I might, it might, you know, I have to be careful. I feel if I, the past three days, I've been feeling a little something in my back. And so um, I think that uh, those of us prone to kidney stones have to be careful about too much vitamin C in an ongoing way. I still think if you got sick, you should like slam the vitamin C. Like, even though I know that about myself, if I got sick, I would start taking three to six grams of vitamin C a day. It's the single best, most well-studied vitamin out there for COVID. It's been studied. And so 100%. But that's the only thing I can think of that would be a problem potentially for him. So have him stay easy on the vitamin C, like 500 to 1,000 a day, and the rest of it should be fine. Don't overeat animal if you're prone to kidney stones. You need to have an alkaline urine. That's how you reduce the calcium excretion in your urine, which is what makes the stones. And so too much animal is too many amino acids and it makes acid in the body. Okay. Um, is it true that quercetin is needed to escort the zinc into the cell membrane to enable zinc to do what it does? Um, I'm, I don't know. I don't think, I don't know, actually. Um, I know that quercetin is, is, um, is being studied right now. Maybe it is because to help facilitate zinc into the cells. Um, I know that there's a role for quercetin that's being studied right now. So maybe that is it. For some reason, that's not sticking in my brain though. So um, if you read that somewhere, then okay. But uh, quercetin is a good antioxidant. Um, is a good antioxidant. And um, but it, I, but I it's I don't think quercetin is needed. Like if you're not taking a quercetin supplement, don't worry that you're not going to get your zinc in. Quercetin is in so many foods. Go online and read quercetin in foods. It's a really, really great um, compound. And like it's in apples. And, and when you read the list, it's in a lot of things. And so you just need to eat fruits and vegetables and you'll get quercetin. If you want to take some, that's fine too. Okay. So 
um, a lot of these things are just in your diet. And the best way to get these things is usually with food. All right. Um, does Pneumovax 23 help against COVID? No, other, other vaccines are not going to help you. We had free antibody tested stop and shop. Yeah, I don't know if that's good. Especially if it was quick, if they did the quick one where 15 minutes later they told you the results. The quick one that I have in my office, I paid a lot, I paid like a chunk of money for a kit that had 50, 50 like cassettes in it. That one, I had a whole bunch of false positives. Um, if you were negative at the stop and shop one, then maybe you could believe that. But if you're positive, I would get confirmation somewhere else. I'm confused by whose statement on COVID immunity. Are they seeing a lot of cases of reinfection? Or are they just being overly cautious? They're just being overly cautious. They just, we just need to know for sure that if you have antibodies and you give, we give you the virus again, you don't get sick again. That's really it. Um, and so we're waiting to see if people who were sick and recovered get sick again and, um, or get it again, or I don't know how they're testing that. It's only being cautious. No one has seen that people got reinfected. And the other problem is that um, the quality of the testing hasn't been perfect, right? There's been a lot of false negative tests in COVID and so the COVID test itself. And so if someone recovers and they have two negative tests and we send, they send them home in China and then two weeks, and then a week later they test and they're positive again, is that a new infection or were they never negative? Was it a fault of the test, right? Did they have false negative testing? And so we have to get our tests more accurate so we can make sure we know that someone's truly negative, they develop antibodies and then they're protected. That's all. It's just cautiousness. That's all. I, I'm sure we are going to have some level of immunity. Otherwise, there's no point in getting a vaccine, right? Because the vaccine is, we're depending that we're going to have antibodies and that they're going to work and they're going to make you, um, make you immune. Um, vaccines triggered your, your autoimmune issues. There's a ton of research that links vaccines to autoimmunity. Vaccines should never be mandated. Oh, yeah. I know. So, so this is just a, a, somebody just posted about, you know, really the big concerns about vaccines. And I'm 100% in agreement with you. And not everybody needs to do this vaccine. I was just stating that I might consider it. And I'm not one who normally does it. But it depends on who you are and how high risk you are. And how deadly this, this um, illness continues to be. As long as 80% of people uh, get vaccinated, then the virus won't, will, keep, will bump into people who are not susceptible. In order to keep spread, it's this whole thing about herd immunity. You know, we need enough people to either get it or to be immunized in order to stop it from just rampaging through the community and killing a lot of folks. And so, um, and so I, I, uh, I hear you and I, I, I am very respectful of everybody's choice when it comes to immunizations. From a public health perspective, I think we do have to find a way to protect ourselves from deadly, deadly infectious diseases. And maybe there'll be a new way to do it other than the way immunizations are done now um, that don't trigger autoimmunity and get people sick. But I have seen a lot of people get sick from vaccines, um, young teenagers from HPV, you know, all sorts of things. And so um, I'm not, uh, but I'm also not 100% anti-vaccine for everyone. So, um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry if I can't, if that's disappointing to you, but um, I also have my master's in public health. So there's a big picture we do have to worry about. And a lot of lives are saved um, from vaccines, but, um, but, for some, but for some people, they can, they can definitely um, have bad side effects from it or get sick from it. And so they're not benign completely. And I do understand that which is why they're, they're, for most people, it's a choice. And I'm hoping they won't man, make it mandatory. I, I'm hoping it'll be a choice to, to get the vaccine or not. Um, how do you feel about socially distanced barbecue? I've been invited to a family gathering and I'm ambivalent. Well, Sue, I think you have to know where everybody, um, you have to know where everybody's been, right? So you have to know, you have to really know your circle, right? So if everybody's been quarantined at home, and no one's been sick, and everyone's been in since the man since our shelter at home order six weeks ago. And you want to go see other family members and stay socially distanced from them and have a barbecue. That's up to you. Um, you have to have a high trust level. You know, like I said last time, it's like that level of trust. You know, you have to have that circle of trust with those people that they have not been exposed. 
um, it's sort of like in my office, you know, we have, um, you know, as long as I'm, I have some people going in every day to work, um, to just manage the administrative stuff and, and I'm my medical assistant. But as soon as one of them, their the second job sort of kicks back and they start going to, you know, someplace where they're exposed, um, when they're not in the office, then I can't let them come back to the office. They're going to have to work from home. Right. So that kind of thing. And so if somebody is in your family, you don't want to go join a barbecue. If there's somebody that's been regularly like working and going someplace where there's exposure, right? Like a, a, um, a healthcare worker or somebody. So, so that, that's sort of up to you. It is going to be a personal decision, but if you have a circle of trust and you know where everybody's been and you know, everybody's been quarantined and everybody's safe, then go have your barbecue. I think we have to, the fear is holding us back from go, doing that. And I think that's going to be the next level actually, as the restrictions loosen up. All right. Um, what tests do we do for diagnosis and what labs? Is it just one test? Um, the test you do for diagnosis is just a COVID test and you still call your doctor for that one. Okay. Or a hotline and you can go in and get a test if you get sick. Um, can you have false negative in the antibody test? Yes. You can have false negative and false positive. Um, the Quest and Lab could do not measure the levels of the antibodies or titers. Not yet. It's just you positive or you're negative. Um, have you heard of Mesa Biotech's test? I haven't. Doesn't mean they're not good. Just haven't heard about them. Um, okay. Um, some flu vaccines have egg whites in formulation. That's not good. Um, you have sensitivity to egg whites. I have not taken so far, but like you, I'm starting to rethink protocols. Your late 60s, how bad a reaction? You might be able to get an egg-free uh, flu vaccine. Um, I'm, I'm pretty certain that you can. So you just need a doctor's note. And then I think there's a pretty... I'm pretty certain that you can get an egg-free one if you have an egg, if you have a problem with eggs. Um, if you decide you want to get the flu shot. Can too much vitamin C cause a sore throat or itchy ears? Hmm. I don't know, maybe. Um, it depends on what's in the tablet. They all have additives. You know, that's the other thing. You have to read the label of ingredients. It says vitamin C, but then it says other ingredients. So just read what's in there. And like the advice I gave before. If you're not sure if something's causing itchy ears, stop all your vitamins, everything, and wait until it goes away. And if it goes away, then at least you know it is your supplements, right? Um, then you'll know it's your supplements, and then uh, you can reintroduce them one at a time every couple of days to see which one might be triggering the response. I took common tablet that was red. The red, red was a dye that caused the top of my tongue to turn red. No other effect, but I stopped using Why well, have dyes? Well, that's a very good point, which is why there's only, you know, when we talk about quality of supplements and how to choose, when you go buy anything, and this is true about food, on my list of, you know, the guidelines for choosing food, it's the same thing as guidelines for choosing supplements. When you read your list of ingredients, you have to read what's in there. It should not have any dye. And if you're at Costco and it says it has red dye number 40 or blue or whatever, don't buy it. Costco has some good supplements that don't have anything added to them, but some of them are not good. So don't buy anything with dye. Don't buy anything that has, um, you know, a long list of preservatives or names propylene glycol. That's a petroleum. You know, there are things that are not good. Um, if you had flu A this year, would it be possible you also had had COVID? Would the antibody test show both if you had both? If you had flu, you will, the, the influenza is not causing a positive antibody test for COVID. That's not part of the false positives. The false positives are for other coronaviruses. Um, and so if you had the flu and you want to know if you had COVID, you yes, you can go. Um, and some people had both at the same, they do think maybe some people had both. You can definitely get an antibody test. Um, it should not be false positive from the flu. Miss the clap discussion should not use, oh, CPAP. <laughs> um, well, I don't know about CPAP. I mean, I think that if, you, um, if you've been quarantined this whole time and you don't have any exposure, use your CPAP machine. But if you have any chance at all that you were exposed or you're starting to get sick, I would hold off because the idea is that it starts out in your, or in your mouth and your nose, the virus, and you want, it's better to swallow it than push it into your lungs. That's why we're saying doing rinses and swallowing. Okay. So, um, you know, nasal, even nasal rinses, you know, with salt or even a little iodine, you know, people are doing those things, especially if you're exposed or you're a healthcare worker. But if you're, if you're fully quarantined, then you're good. You can do that. You can use your CPAP machine. 
is canine to canine transmission a concern more than human to canine? I, I, I heard in the news there was one dog that was positive. I don't know what that means at this point. I'm not really concerned about the dogs. Is going out of the house for groceries considered breaking quarantine? No, it's fine. Uh oh, with respect to contact with other family outside household and fully quarantined. Um, I would say um, most people are going out shopping. And I don't consider that breaking the quarantine in terms of other family members. But you do have to ask questions like, okay, let me do a survey of your family before we get together. Who's going? How often are you going shopping? Who's going? What are you doing when you go shopping? Are you really protecting yourself? Are you wiping things down? Are you wearing a mask? You know, just, just make sure you're satisfied with their answers. At some point, you sort of have to trust that, um, I think. Um, so you just, it, you know, I'm, I'm definitely very aggressive in my questions, my questioning of everybody, you know, someone with dry mouth, take the saliva test. Yeah, actually the saliva test, um, the one that's, that just came out that I just ordered some kits, this is for COVID. They give you a saline to rinse and then you spit back. So even if you have dry mouth, it'll be fine. Um, when you said we should wait three to four weeks to get the antibody test, is that three to four weeks since you've recovered? No, three to four weeks from when you first got sick. So four weeks from when you first got sick. Um, can you give your supplement protocols and dosages again? I'm going to send you to my website, okay? So BlumHealthMD.com. BlumHealthMD.com. Click on blog. Actually, the blog, you can get to it from my main website too, BlumCenterForHealth.com. Go on the website, click on blog, and just scroll down, and my updated supplement list is there. It's living there and I update it when I want to change something. Okay, so it's there. Can you suggest a brand of salt that's not bleached but has iodine? I'm having the devil of a time finding iodine. I know. It's a problem. Um, iodine salt. I couldn't find it in the store this week. Also, is there a concern of getting too many supplements collectively and taking a multi, the shakes, and all the supplements we need to take for the arthritis challenge and detox program? Um, usually, in, in any of the programs that I put forward to people. Um, the list is meant to, you know, add up everything so that it all could be taken together. If you have any, if you're doing any of my programs and you have any questions for me um, or anyone in my team, you know, Melissa is our health coach and she answers all the questions. You've probably all worked with her already. You can ask questions that are supplement related, especially if you're taking my protocols and the arthritis, read my books. Um, my, I have a website that's just addresses the book and all the book stuff. And it's BlumHealthMD.com. Okay. And, um, and so there's that. So go there and then there's a support button in the bottom right corner. It's a little button. It says support. You click on it, pops up and there's an email submission. It goes to Melissa and you can ask her specific questions about the supplements. Okay. About like the supplement protocols that we use. Okay. Um, okay. Hi, Gina. So, so is Nax still good to maximize glutathione levels? Yes. Trisomal glutathione is good too. Okay. Cause those are, those are liposomal glutathione's. Um, so getting your glutathione up both those ways is very good. Um, I also listened to my glass to home epidemiology straight shooter. Good. I'm glad. Thank you for thanking me. I'm glad you're all. Oh, Andrographis. Thank you, Marla. <laughs> I'm going, there's another A somewhere. Andrographis. Actually, Andrographis is a really nice, um, immune support, uh, natural killer booster, um, uh, herb. Thank you. Andrographis. Why is it better that collagen is undenatured? If I remember you saying that a while ago. Um, okay. First question, because I didn't say that wasn't collagen. I think I was talking about whey protein, undenatured whey. So whey protein has to be the whole cold processed molecule because it has immune properties then. Um, I don't know if I mentioned, if I said undenatured collagen, but I know that whey does, you know, you want whey, it's cold processed so that, because whey has immune properties, actually whey has, um, supports your immune system if it's in its whole and intact molecule. So denatured means it was heated and that the, the actual protein itself got broken down into its different amino acid components. Why is it better that our flu shot comes from an individual vial versus being drawn from a larger vat container? The larger container, that's an easy one. The larger container has thimerosal, which is the um, preservative. The individual containers do not have the preser preservative, so it won't have the mercury. 
What, what is it about this virus that makes it so deadly? We're trying to figure that out. There's something that it's doing that we don't quite know. And that's why I was, that's what I was alluding to before, that until it's not so deadly, it affects different, it doesn't just affect the lungs. And so we're trying to figure out all the ways it affects the body and how it's causing such destruction in the oxygenation for people. Um, if you're prone to canker sores, is there a way to take the extra vitamin C without triggering a breakout? I didn't know that you sh that vitamin C would trigger a breakout. Just don't, is it because it's in your mouth? Because canker sores are a virus or just a, a, just a regular, you know, um, a regular virus. So I don't know why vitamin C would be a problem for that. Um, so you would want to make sure to do it in capsules, maybe. I don't know. Um, I agree. Everyone should have a choice. Yes. Yes. No, I agree with you, Marina. I, I think everyone should have a choice about vaccines because everyone has a unique health profile and we should need to make the decision one at a time um, based upon everyone's health needs. Is the finger prick test any less accurate than the blood draw for antibodies? From this company, from KBMO, no. They did all their in-house studies to compare the, the blood draw and the finger stick. So I do feel comfortable about the finger stick one that, that this company is offering. Oh, Melissa said on denatured collagen. Okay, well, you stumped me then. I don't remember why. Um, I just think that in, in general, undenatured is always better. Let me just think about that for a second. So undenatured, just in general, undenatured, um, when you take a supplement or a protein, you want it to be its full molecule intact. So um, I have to go back and freshen up on why that matters for collagen. Um, sorry, I'm just blanking out on that. Okay, and um, so that finishes up my, um, so maybe we'll go back, send Melissa that question and I'll, I'll figure out an answer for her before that time comes. Some of you stuck some things up on the Q&A. Um, so try to put that on the chat the next time. What I see is that um, Abbott Labs is advertising 99% accuracy of their antibody tests. Um, do you think the accuracy can vary significantly across tests or is it marketing? No. I think that's fantastic. We just all have to get that test then. Um, is the home test any less accurate than the blood draw test? The home, the home test is going to be, it depends, the, each company is going to have their accuracy percentage. But 99% for Avid still means one in 100 people are going to be a false positive. So that's what that means. So, but it still means 99% of the time it's going to be spot on. So Abbott's saying it's 99%, great. Um, and so if Abbott makes a home test or a lab test, it doesn't matter whether it's home or in the lab, it's the company itself that you want to make sure that it's, um, that it's accurate. You just, stay, you just stay to look at labs for testing of low false positives. Um, what percentage would justly be considered low, like less than, I think you want to have like, like Abbott's 99% accurate, which means it has a 1% false positive. And I don't know if that also means false negative. I would say it's probably just, they're probably just talking about false positives there. Um, and so they have a 1% chance of a false positive. So I would say you want to be up above 95, you know, like 5% false positive, I think would be good. Technically speaking, the, the FDA approves companies if they're above 90%, you know, but the, the more towards 100, the better. Um, how do you feel about a socially distanced barbecue? Oh, you posted that elsewhere. And last question, should anyone with a history of autoimmune be cautious about the vaccine? Oh, we talked about this. Daughter developed Guillain barre after the flu vaccine last year. Yes. So definite concerns, um, definite concerns about vaccines. It's no different than the concerns about vaccines that, that, you, that everyone's already had. Um, Let's see what, how it comes out. Let's see how deadly the virus is. And then everyone will have to make that decision for themselves. I believe vaccines are an individual choice um, depend, and everyone will make their choice. Um, but I have definitely seen a lot of autoimmunity um, and, uh, and it does concern me um, in terms of vaccines. It's a little bit of a risk. There's a risk and then there's a benefit. And we're gonna have to see where we are with that risk benefit ratio. Um, does my lab measure IgG and IgM? Quest just does IgG. KBMO does IgG and IgM. Um, should all high risks still stay home? Yeah, I'm still home. Cuomo says May 20th, so I'm home. Um, okay, that's it. Phew, we got through the whole thing. Um, the last thing I do want to tell everyone is that um, we at Blum Center 
we've created, you know, a lot of people have been contacting me and wanting to have some sort of an immune consult to just check their vitamins and see how they're doing and any questions and concerns that they have. So what we've done was we created something called an immune consult and it's 45 minutes. You can come in as a new patient just for that. You don't have to become a whole new patient of Blum Center. You can just come in and do the immune consult. Um, and just get started with us that way for 45 minutes. Elizabeth, our nurse practitioner, is seeing people for $295 for an immune consult, even as a new patient. And if you want to stay working with us, you can roll that into a new patient fee, or you can just come and do it once um, to just get a good assessment on everything you're doing, everything you're taking, and if you, you know, and to get some functional medicine sort of feedback. If you want to learn more about that, just go to my main website, BlumCenterForHealth.com. And you'll see that um, there's a banner right at the top, which talks about the new immune consult. Now that we can do telemedicine, um, it's very exciting because no matter where you live now, we can, we can offer you consults. And I wanted to lower the barrier of entry of needing to fully fledged join as a, as a new patient at the practice, where instead we just wanna offer support. Dr. Yi is also doing the immune consult. I'm not, but Elizabeth and Dr. Yi are both doing that. And uh, Pam Yi. And, so you can see either one of them. Um, you just have to talk to Teresa at my office and she's, she'll help you understand more about that. But go to my website, blumpcenterforhealth.com and, um, and you will see how to find out more information. But please come and learn more. We're here. Great to see you all. Have a great day. I'll see you next Friday. Hopefully we'll have even more information about some of this stuff next week.